We would like to welcome John Gee as our next presenter. John Gee has a PhD from Yale University. He's currently the William Bill Gay Research Professor of Egyptology and a Senior Research Fellow at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. He formerly taught at Yale University and worked at the Department of Egyptian Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He has more in his bio you can read. And, we'd like to and the title of his, um, of his presentation is The Book of Abraham, I presume. So we'd like to welcome John Gee. Uh, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, according to some uh, internet discussion groups, I understand I'm here as the comic relief. <laughs> so um, I've, I've rewritten this talk several times, uh, never quite settling on a subject, uh, and some of that may, you may find evidence of that in the program. So when they asked me what I was going to talk on, I said, Book of Abraham, I presume. Uh, <laughs> I was originally going to talk about how the presuppositions we make about the Book of Abraham color the way we look at the text, uh, but now I'm going to give you a baker's dozen of things that I've published about the Book of Abraham in the last five years. And this is not all that I've published, not even all that I've published on the Book of Abraham, and also includes only the work that has actually appeared in print, and none of the things that are still in the pipeline. And I'm organizing these topics, not chronologically, but rather in something of a logical order. So let's start with the relationship of the Book of Abraham to the Joseph Smith papyri. There are three different points of view here. One, that uh, Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham from the papyri that we have. Almost no one really believes this. But to hear the critics tell it, this is the official position of the church. It's not. Uh, nor do most members of the church subscribe to this, as far as I can tell. Uh, the second one is, so it's a straw man. The second one is that the book of Abraham, or, or Joseph Smith translated the book of Abraham from papyri that we do not currently have. And this is the position that most accords with the historical evidence. And the third one is that Joseph Smith received the Book of Abraham strictly by revelation and did not come from for the papyri at all. Uh, this position seems to be popular among Latter-day Saints, but seems to have no historical evidence to support it. Now, let's illustrate this in another way. Let's let these represent the scrolls that Joseph Smith had. These are not, not to scale, they're not in size, but you have have these, the scroll of Horus, the scroll of Semenes, the Amenothis scrolls, and another scroll, and these mounted fragments. And the first theory says that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham from the mounted fragments. This is an anti-Mormon theory, and Latter-day Saints simply do not believe it, and though you might find a few that do. The second theory says that the Book of Abraham was translated from another scroll without necessarily specifying which one, but not from the mounted fragments. And the third story says that the Book of Abraham was not on any scroll that Joseph Smith presented. Now, Egyptologists tell us that the mounted fragments were from the Book of the Dead and the, book of, and the document of breathings made by Isis. We agree with them. Egyptologists also tell us that neither of these is the Book of Abraham, and we agree with them there, too. Um, the contents of the mounted fragments that we currently have are irrelevant to the debate about the Book of Abraham since the historical sources say that the Book of Abraham was on a scroll, not on the fragments. So it does not matter what W.W. W. Phelps thought about the papyri. We can stipulate that the text of the Book of, of the Mounted Fragments are the Book of the Dead and the Document of Breathings Made by Isis. So that it is useless for Egyptologists to try to prove what we have already stipulated. Now the problem with the, uh, problem can be looked at another way. We have these four scrolls that we know that Joseph Smith had. We know he had a scroll of Horus, a scroll of Semenes, a scroll of uh, hypocephalus of Sasankas and a 
some fragments from Amuthas, or maybe a scroll, we don't really know. And then we have these eyewitness descriptions, uh, so that one of them is that there were a number of glazed slides, like picture frames containing sheets of papyrus with Egyptian descriptions and hieroglyphics. Uh, there was a long roll of manuscripts, another roll, and two or three other small pieces of papyrus with astronomical calculations, epitaphs, etc. Now, the number of glazed slides uh, went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and then to the church. The long roll of manuscript, the other roll, and the two or three small pieces of papyrus seem to have gone to the Wood Museum, though you could probably argue that some of the two or three small pieces may be the glazed slides. And all the Mormon and non-Mormon eyewitnesses identify the long roll of manuscripts as the one containing the Book of Abraham. So the fact that you don't find the Book of Abraham on these mounted fragments isn't a problem because the historical sources say that it's on a different papyrus. So, now looking at some of the studies published. At the American Research Center in Egypt meetings, I presented a paper that showed that most of what, or much of what the uh, uh, Egyptological community thinks it knows about the Joseph Smith papyri is wrong. Egyptologists have either not read the literature on the Joseph Smith papyri or they have not understood it. They seem to think that Latter-day Saints believe that Joseph Smith somehow translated the Book of Abraham from the document of breathings made by Isis, but we don't. Therefore, they think that all they have to do is to translate the document of breathings made by Isis and that it will convince Latter-day Saints to give up their religion because they have demonstrated that what they think we believe is not true. And all they've shown is that what they think we believe isn't true um, because it isn't what we believe. Um, so, what they really demonstrate when they do this is that they don't understand the argument. Now, in an inter editor's introduction to an approach to the Book of Abraham, I tell the story of how Joseph Smith, or not Joseph Smith, how Hugh Nibley got involved, started in Egyptology, and show how the story of the rediscovery of the Joseph Smith papyri uh, was nothing of the sort. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art always knew what they had. They always knew it belonged to Joseph Smith. Uh, they had circulated photographs in the early 1960s, and Hugh Nibley had actually seen some of these before the papyri were rediscovered. Um, and one of the more... Uh, so that story isn't quite correct, and if you want to, you can read uh, what I have to say in that book, in the introduction to that book. Uh, we'll give you some of the documentation. Now, one of the more remarkable aspects of, of Hugh Nibley's involvement in this is that he was in the library stacks one day in the late 50s and got this prompting that he ought to go study Egyptology. Now, he tried to do this before, and it was that he should go to Berkeley and, and study Egyptology. So he arranged for a sabbatical and he thought it was going to be a big waste of time because he went round and round with Lutz before and uh, never got anywhere because Lutz hated Mormons. And he arrived at Berkeley the day that Lutz was packing his office, having retired and Klaus Baer stepping in. Uh, but he was able to take that one impression and use his his mind, his training to, to study Egyptian and to prepare himself so that when the papyri actually came forth uh, again in 67, he recognized what was Book of the Dead and that there was another document, this document of breathings made by Isis, that everybody had just assumed was a Book of the Dead without bothering to read it. And he read it and said, this isn't Book of the Dead, this is this other text. And he was the one who identified that. And Klaus Baer would give him credit. Uh, nobody else does. Um, now the Joseph Smith papyri tells a few things about, uh, about the owners of the papyri. And one of these is the titles of, of Horus, the owner of Joseph Smith papyrus 1, 11, and 10. 
Now, one of the, the ti his titles is the prophet of men who massacres his enemies. And an examination of everything known about this obscure cult uh, and figure shows that Horace would have been involved in mock human sacrifice on a regular basis. Um, and other, other things that show up in, in here is that uh, we have some genealogy now for Horace, but this expands it and provides some of the people with genealogy with actual dates. So in the past, they've, they've fudged where, where it actually dates to, and this, this one gives some, some actual dates to some of the people in, uh, who own the papyri. Now, as some of you may be aware, I caused something of a, a furor five years back uh, here at the FAIR conference when I applied a formula developed by my colleague Friedhelm Hofmann to the Joseph Smith papyri. Now, the idea behind the formula is that the interior portion of a papyrus is contained by the outer proportion of the papyrus and thus is bounded finite and can be calculated. Now, I had applied Hoffman's formula to the Joseph Smith papyri years before and sat on the results because when I uh, used standard papyrus lengths and said, well, they would have been about 10 feet long, no one would believe me. And so when I did the calculations and they came out at 41 feet, um, no one was going, I knew no one was going to believe me on that either. Uh, and this has proven to be the case. Uh, but I'd applied it, uh, I'd applied it to the the, to Joseph Smith Papyrus 1, 10, and 11, and I hadn't applied it to the others. But when I applied it to the others, the numbers came out reasonable. So I said, well, I may as well let this go. Um, no one complained, or has complained, as they should have, that the results for the other papyri are too short. Um, uh, but as a, a result, um, Andy Cook uh, developed a slightly different formula, and he and Chris Smith applied to one of the papyri. And they've been loudly proclaiming that they who have never worked with papyri know more than I who have been working with papyri for a quarter of the century. Now, I realize that none of these formulas have actually ever been tested with a real papyrus to see if, it, if they work. Uh, so I measured a scroll in Toronto that I'd seen in the back rolls of the museums before it was unrolled. It was about this big around. And I applied these, and it's now it, it was this big around when it was rolled up, and it's uh, five meters, no, or seven meters. Anyway, it's, it's pretty good size. So I applied this, the various formula to the measurements to see how they fared, and this was published this year in a, an article called Formulas in Faith. Now, this is the graph is the result of my little study. Now, you can see Hoffman's formula is somewhat erratic. I can't see the laser pointer, and maybe you can't either. So it's the, this really erratic one. Uh, it matches the actual length of the scroll much better than Andy Cook's formula, which is the one there on the bottom. Cook made some errors in his calculations. And to show you the errors of the calculation, I want to show you the same chart at a slightly different scale, and I'm going to take Kaufman formula out. So the one on top is the actual length of this scroll. The one on the bottom is where Cook's formula uh, predicts that it will be. Uh, now, when Cook's article came out, I read it and identified five different errors that Cook made in his formula. And if you fix just one of those mistakes, you get this chart, which you can see that you can come up with something that tracks much more closely to the actual length of the papyrus. The errors are therefore something in Cook's formula and methodology and not in the papyrus measurements. It shows us that Cook's methodology is fundamentally flawed. Now, I attribute Cook's mistakes to working in a new field where neither he nor Chris Smith had any experience working with papyrus before. And there are some math mistakes which for some reason Cook did not catch. As you can see, if he'd corrected one mistake, it would have made a big difference in his results. There are still other three other mistakes in the formula that correspond to physical features of the papyri. One of them are these spikes right here. 
One of them are these dips like there, and the third is uh, this little mismatch in the corner. Uh, and the fifth one actually deals with the Joseph Smith papyrus, not the uh, general formula. So unfortunately for Cook and Smith, if you fix the math on their formula, then according to their formula, the length of Horace's scrolls needs to be about four times what they calculated. I come up with 314 centimeters, which is 10 feet, three and a half inches, uh, give or take a foot. Because wait, there's more. One of the things that I have learned with this experience is that I've identified a number of fallacious assumptions uh, made by both formulas that undermine my confidence in any of them. The last three errors that I identified are irreparable. The best the formulas can then therefore do is give a ballpoint estimate. And that a ballpark estimate is a useful thing to know. But in the meantime, Matt Roper has discovered a, a few more 19th century eyewitnesses accounts of the papyri, and I've discovered a couple of other 19th century sources that put the papyri in a different light and identify some other problematic assumptions that we've made. One of these eyewitnesses describes, after Joseph Smith's death, the Book of Abraham being on a completely intact roll. Now, all the theories about calculating the papyri presume that they might be the damaged outer portion of a scroll that contained the Book of Abraham, or a purported source of the Book of Abraham. This new source shows that we have presumed incorrectly. And I actually started this mess ten, about 10 years ago with an article I wrote in the Anderson Feshrift. Now, it is entirely possible that the fragments we currently have of the Joseph Smith papyri could be the outer portion of an intact interior roll. I still believe that they were. But according to the newfound non-Mormon eyewitness account, the Book of Abraham seems to have been on a very long and completely intact roll, and therefore not even on the same scroll as the fragments we have. And this in turn means that none of the fragments of the Joseph Smith papyri that we have is from the same scroll as the Book of Abraham. And if, of course, if none of the fragments comes, that we currently have comes from the same scroll as the Book of Abraham, then the fact that none of the texts on them matches the Book of Abraham is not a problem. Critics of the church have presumed that the Book of Abraham must be on the fragments that we currently have. And why they assume that is beyond me. The historical evidence is against such a conclusion. Uh, so, now moving on with other matters pertaining to the papyri. One of the things that we know about Horus is that he was a prophet of Hespasihis. This means that he was involved in a religion that believed in angels and miraculous healings and had foundational stories about how pharaohs took any woman that took their fancy and made them, uh, married them. So moving along, we'll look at uh, recent research on facsimile one. Uh, at a paper at an international Egyptological conference, uh, this one was in Warsaw, I saw show that there's a connection between facsimile one and execration rituals, which are mock human sacrifices. Uh, and I started out with the Joseph Smith papyri, uh, showed parallels to facsimile one on the, uh, on the screen and read the execration texts that are associated with them and show there's this, this human sacrifice and, and that these scenes were connected with human sacrifice by the ancient Egyptians. And so the Egyptologists, when they got done with it, uh, the questions I got were, do they do this with animals too? So the idea of, of those connections isn't odd and they didn't find it so. Uh, let's move on, oh, and it was in, published in, in that book. Let's move on to uh, facsimile two. Now, many of you know that facsimile two is also known as a hypocephalus. Hypocephali are known to Egyptologies that are round discs that are put under the heads of mummies to, to uh, create a fire under the heads. As it turns out, none of these three, three things are true. Uh, hypocephali are not necessarily put under the heads of the mummies. The instructions in the Book of the Dead only say that they're to be placed at the head, not under the head. 
So we find them both at the, at the heads, under the heads of mummies and atop the heads of mummies. Uh, the term that's translated a flame, uh, one of the textual variants shows that this should be a lamp or a torch. Uh, and the other thing that turns out to be false is that they are round. They can be round, but they can also be rectangular, or this one, which is three-dimensional. Now, for a number of years, I have tr worked on trying to get a grasp on Egyptian religion and particularly trying to understand something about the Egyptian equivalence of the soul. And there's a section of this on my dissertation. I've got four published articles on the subject. This is the latest one. It, as a result of that, I'm able to show that uh, Egyptian priests, when translating their native terms into Greek, translate one of them as angel. And guess which one it is? It's figure one, in fact, only one in the Book of Abraham that's said to be an angel. Now, I didn't go looking for this connection. It was just a pleasant surprise to find it. Uh, and the facsimile three has often been neglected in discussions for the, of the facsimiles. And I have an extensive article on uh, facsimile three in this volume, another international conference, this one in Paris. And I show that there is a connection between facsimile three and Abraham and have a lot of discussion about uh, some of the things that, uh, that uh, are associated with that particular facsimile. Uh, it turns out to be very, very interesting. Uh, and you can read it. Now, finally, we need to actually consider the text of the Book of Abraham itself. So for Latter-day Saints, the rest of these issues are all peripheral. Uh, you go sit down at random in sacrament meeting and uh, ask the person next to you uh, about the Book of Abraham, and they will only think of the text. So let's look at a couple of issue, uh, things in the text. Years ago, John Twetness, Brian Hoglid, and I put together a volume of all the stories that were circulating about the sacrifice of Abraham in antiquity. Unfortunately, we missed one. And this is one of the Egyptian ones, which I published in this volume of essays dedicated to Kent Brown. This is a story that tells about how Pharaoh, and that's the term they actually use in the text, tried to sacrifice Abraham, but that Abraham was saved by an angel. Then Pharaoh wants to know how Abraham was saved, so he sends his court to Abraham to ask about his God. So Abraham uses astronomy to teach Pharaoh's court about God. This sounds familiar. Uh, in fact, of all the stories that we gathered, this one is closer than any of them to the book of Abraham, and it's in Egyptian. Now, one of the things that, that critics have found either funny or absurd is the expression from the introduction to the Book of Abraham, that it was the Book of Abraham written by his own hand upon papyrus. Um, uh, one critic even used the phrase as a title for his book. He intended it to be ironic or an accusation of some sort. I deal with that in my contribution to this volume, um, where I point out that this papyrus here mentions a text that is written by his own hand on papyrus, as you can see right here. <laughs> Can't say I didn't show you it to show it to you. You can read it for yourself. Now, one of the first things that pops up in the the Book of Abraham, of course, is his um, his sacrifice. And Kerry Mulstein and I looked at human sacrifice in Egypt in Abraham's day. And we found that there are three clear cases and looked at their context. The earliest of these ca cases is the historical inscriptions of Sesostris I. Sesostris describes sacrificing priests at Toad who were not performing their priestly duties the way that Sesostris wanted them to. Big mistake. Uh, the next case was archaeological evidence of human sacrifice found at Mergissa in Nubia. This is an area outside of Egypt, but under Egyptian control. The body was found as part of an execration assemblage. You've been hearing a lot of that term these days. Uh, for those of you who don't know how an Egyptian does an execration thing, they, um, 
we, we know what they do with figures of wax, and we also know that archaeologically this is what they do with humans. You bind the hands on the back, you write the name on it, uh, you throw them on the ground, trample them under your left foot, spit on them, stab them, decapitate them, dump them, throw them in the fire, and spit on them while they're burning. Lovely. Uh, and, and they actually found this part of an execration assemblage with smashed pottery and uh, decapitated skeleton. And the third example is the Ugoff stela, which prescribes human sacrifice for anyone who's found in a sacred precinct other than a priest performing his duties. And looking at these th cases, we found four common threads. First, the ritual nature of the human sacrifice is clear. Second, the sacrifices for cultic offenses. Third, the pharaoh is involved and the sacrifices under his orders. And fourth, the sacrifice could, not, could take place not only in Egypt, but areas outside of Egypt and under Egyptian control. Now, if we look at the Book of Abraham, we find the same four elements. Uh, the nature of the sacrifice is ritual, so it is described as an offering and as a sacrifice, and it was done after the manner of the Egyptians. Uh, if you look at human sacrifice up in Syria where Abraham lives, or lived, they actually do it a little bit differently. Uh, the second thing is the sacrifice seems to be for cultic offenses. Uh, Abraham's fathers were turned wholly to the worshiping of the gods of the heathen, including the god of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Abraham cl claims that his fathers utterly refused to hearken to my voice, indicating that he had spoken against such practice. And if you actually look at the Middle Kingdom execration text, speaking against the king or his practices is a good way to get capital punishment. The Pharaoh was somehow involved uh, from Abraham 120, and uh, the sacrifice takes place outside the boundaries of Egypt, which in the, our book of Abraham he never gets to but in an area under Egyptian influence. So the attempted sacrifice of Abraham in the book of Abraham matches what we know about Egyptian human sacrifice in Abraham's day. Now, why should we care about the book of Abraham? Well, we need to understand why the book of Abraham is important. The book of Abraham is not like the book of Mormon. It has no equivalent of Moroni's promise. It is not a sign of the prophetic calling of Joseph Smith, but it has had a deep and lasting impact on Latter-day Saint culture to an extent that many things in LDS culture would not exist if it were not for the Book of Abraham. So this is a map of the plan of salvation showing the principal scriptural sources for each section down below. As you can see, the distinctive parts of the map for Latter-day Saints are based on different passages. And there's more than one passage for each portion, except uh, only the book of Abraham deals with the pre-existence. Now, there are other scriptural passages dealing with the pre-existence, but these can be narrowly construed. For example, uh, Moses 4 only discusses the pre-existence of Jesus and Satan. We are not mentioned. Only the book of Abraham includes all those who live on earth have lived on earth and will live on earth as having an existence before this mortal birth. So the book of Abraham is really the book of scripture that gives us our ideas about the preexistence and these ideas permeate Latter-day Saint thought. They are very distinctive. To show the impact, consider how without the book of Abraham we would not have the following. Preexistence forms parts of the plots of books such as Added Upon, that's for you Dan, and musicals such as Saturday's Warrior, and my turn on earth. As well as songs such as I am a child of God, teach me to walk in the light, I lived in heaven, faith, how dear to God are little children, I will follow God's plan, and the Lord gave me a temple, from the children's songbook. If you don't know about these, you need to spend more time in primary. As well as hymns such as How Great the Wisdom and the Love, again we meet around the board, O oh, Thou Before the World Began, O oh, What Songs of the Heart, Oh, my father, and of course, if you could hide a kolob with its explicit references to the book of Abraham, and it was actually written by one of the scribes involved in the translation. Now, not all of these expressions of, of LDS culture can be considered high points. Um, I'll let you decide which, which those might be. Um, but some of them are very 
are deeply moving expressions of heartfelt belief. Uh, there are some of us who are disappointed that we only sing four verses of how great the wisdom and the love. Check out verse five and six sometime. Nevertheless, from the high to the low, the Book of Abraham has influenced LDS culture and has done so for a long time. So if we lost the Book of Abraham, we would still have the fullness of the gospel, faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and endurance to the end, since these are contained in the Book of Mormon. We would also have the priesthood authority, including the keys, such as the sealing power. But we might note that the sealing power was not given until after the Book of Abraham that we have was revealed, and the temple endowment was not given to church members until after the publication of the Book of Abraham. It will probably come as a surprise to many that I do not have a testimony of the Book of Abraham. That is, I have never received a spiritual confirmation of the truth of the Book of Abraham. I do not need one. I have those for the Book of Mormon, the restoration of the gospel, the calling of the prophet Joseph Smith, and the continuation of those keys and authority through the present day. If you have these things confirmed to you, you do not need to get a cold from every wind of doctrine that blows. It does not matter what some Egyptologist says about the papyri. You might be perplexed for the present, but you've already proved God in days that are past. Abraham actually uses this reasoning in the second uh, chapter of the book of Abraham. When God, um, so hither, at this point in the book of Abraham, he's had only one experience of God to go on. This is the second time that God has actually spoken to him. And when God asks him to do something difficult, he replies to God, Thou didst send thine angel to deliver me from the gods of Elkanah, and I will do well to hearken unto thy voice. It's not for nothing that Abraham is the father of the faithful. Abraham is willing to trust God on the basis of one experience. Those of us who have made covenants with God have done so on the basis of experiences with him. We can have faith in him, that is, trust him, because we have tested him in some things. I trust God. I'm not always able to do that with some of my colleagues, uh, and I do not trust dissenters and anti-Mormons. I've had too many experiences with all of them to change any of that. Thank you. I promised Scott I would get us back on time. All right. So, will the Church Museum of History and Art or the Church Historical Library ever put the remaining fragments of the papyri on public display? I don't know, you'd have to ask them. Um, Are there Joseph Smith papyri in existence that LDS scholars are denied access? Um, to my knowledge, we are only denied access to those we don't know about. Um, what are the five errors from the Cook Smith paper? Oh, that's, that's a long topic. Um, I don't know, I've just put this as a, as, as a teaser from them. It's their mistake, they need to correct it. Um, let's see. What are your thoughts about the paper Egyptian alphabet and grammar that Smith produced and was later proven false? That's W.W. W. Phelps, not Smith. And we can show that. Uh, but that's, that's down the line a bit, it's coming. Um, this one's a long one, um, but I'm only going to read this one. What about the facsimiles? Well, I have a book that's in production on that. I have to wait for it to come out, sorry. Um, Would you comment on Nibley's analysis of manuscript and mentions Egyptian endowment 
Was that a reasonable way to view that manuscript? Uh, I deal with this in the introduction to uh, the second edition of Message of the Joseph Smith Papyri. Uh, it's actually a remarkably insightful view that uh, um, more Egyptologists have come around to, and I actually deal with this in uh, the paper from the Paris conference um, because some of the versions of those manuscripts, or some of the versions of Factionally 3 explicitly label it as an initiation, something that we might compare with an endowment. Uh, what happened to the original papyri Joseph Smith had, and what is a good resource to learn more about the Book of Abraham? Uh, the original papyri are, I covered that. Uh, they're, they're split into, well, Abel Combs got the papyri from Lucy Smith, and he split them up, and some of them he sold that ended up in Chicago and burned in the Chicago Fire of 1871. Uh, others of them, uh, the mounted fragments ended up in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Are there others? Well, that's possible. Um, we don't know for certain, uh, but that's possible. Um, let's see. Do I or one of my associates at BYU Farms plan on a response review of Robert Rittner's new book, Attacking the Book of Abraham? Yes, if I can get it done. Um, oh, I already dealt with that one. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we're going to make one quick change since John got us on track. We're going to keep you here for about eight more minutes. And if John Lynch wants to come this direction, I'll have I do something else. We're going to take care of our fair business now and then we're going to go to lunch. Now let me explain to you what when you do go to lunch, look to see if you have a little lunch, little little blue square on your name badge that gives you the lunch. If you hang around when after all the lunches are all taken, wait about ten minutes. And if there's lunches left over and you don't have a blue, blue thing, then you may take a lunch and uh, just make sure I get one and, and Cal gets one. He's, we're usually the last ones to get them. Um, and then uh, make a donation at the bookstore uh, of whatever amount you feel is appropriate. I do want to ask uh, one favor. Those of you who are involved in FAIR, the FAIR apologetics list or anything, could you please stand up or raise your hand if you can't stand up? Thank you for the work that you do. And those of you who are involved in the Mormon Voices email list, I don't know if you have any here or not. Do you have any? Could you stand up or raise your hand? Stand up, please. Again, thank you for the work you do. It's great. With that, I'm going to turn the time over to John Lynch. Thanks, God. I realize that I have put myself in a very precarious situation. I am standing between you and food. So I'll try and be brief. Um, the, we try and take an opportunity every year to give some recognition to specific individuals who have made significant contributions in helping fare with its mission. Our mission, our objective, our goal is to help defend the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints against critics inside and out, of course, um, against all criticisms which really diminish in the sight of people of faith um, the reality of the restoration. We have an abiding witness ourselves, those who participate in fair, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the restored Church of Jesus Christ. We believe that, and we believe that despite the weaknesses of the humans who are involved in all aspects of our history and otherwise, that this is the place where we can come to make our covenants with our Father in Heaven. And we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to take and dispel some of the misinformation that is put out about that, that keeps some people away from coming to that same realization. We sometimes have individuals who write into us and ask questions. We have an Ask the Apologist feature. And there is nothing more gratifying for us than when we get somebody to write in and say, thank you, I was struggling with this, and my concerns 
have been taken care of. Or I was worried about this and I didn't know what to say because I had this neighbor that brought up this issue and you've given me something that I can say. We don't have all the answers. We don't claim to have all the answers, but we do believe that despite whatever we don't know, that we will find and we will continue to discover the abiding truths that will reinforce the reality of the restoration. We have many volunteers. There's about 150 people directly associated with FAIR, and we invite anybody that's interested and that believes in the things that we're doing to come and join with us and help us. We have uh, what we call our FAIR Apologetics List, which helps contribute in content to our resources. We have our FAIR Wiki. The Wiki has uh, well above 4,000 individual articles on critical issues uh, pertaining to the church. They're in-depth treatments. You can get a quick snapshot analysis with in-depth treatment of each of these subjects. It is the greatest repository that you'll find anywhere on earth relative to anything that might challenge your faith about the LDS church. These things don't come about by accident. They come about because of hard research, diligent effort of specific individuals who sacrifice their time and talent. And what's even more remarkable is that all of this is done without paid, without paid staff. We operate, and you'll, many of you will be surprised to know this, we operate on a budget of about $30,000 a year, which includes this conference. So when you look at it in terms of the expenses that, that we could be facing and what we're able to accomplish, it really is on the backs of individuals who don't do this for personal reward. They don't do it for gain. We're not high-paid apologist hacks. Okay, We might be hacks, but we're not high-paid. Um, and, and so because of that, you know, it really is, for me at least, it's evidence that people are doing this specifically because they believe in what they're doing. So it's very important for us to recognize individuals who go out of their way and make significant contributions. For, since the beginning of, uh, of FAIR holding these conferences, we have given out what's known as the John Taylor Defender of the Faith Award. It has always gone to a single individual. And it was given to the individual who we felt did the most to contribute to the defense of the church in the previous 12 months, oftentimes because it was a, a proximity to us in association with FAIR. The challenge that we fa are faced with this year is that, quite honestly, um, we, we have a couple of people who have really made significant contributions. Now, I'm going to do a commercial here. I'm going to interrupt myself and do a commercial because Scott asked me to. Um, but if you go to the bookstore, for example, we have volunteers that, that helped set up that bookstore. They did great work. And I would love to give an award to each and every one of them. We have people uh, uh, who have helped with fair productions where we produce videos and things like that to try and make this great information, the very great scholarly information you hear, you you read here and you, you, you receive from the presenters and help present it in a way that the average member can absorb it. So we produce videos and things. In, in, along those lines, we've got Mike Ash who wrote um, Shaken Face Syndrome. You can find it in our bookstore. It helps people figure out how do they deal with issues of crisis of faith, specifically dealing with the LDS Church. We've got the Bible versus the Book of Mormon, um, which is a, a response to criticisms about how does the Book of Mormon stand up versus the, the Bible. We've got the Book of Mormon and New World DNA, which has just uh, had a, a new face put on it. We've just done a, a new analysis of it, or a, excuse me, a, a reworking of that video. We recently released a most remarkable book, The Evidences for the Divine Authenticity of the Book of Abraham, which basically takes, and takes a very complex subject of the Book of Abraham and puts it in the context of faith. Um, and we're, we're shortly expecting to release again the, re the book Restoring the Ancient Church by Barry Bickmore. It's going to go out, it's going to be a revised edition, it's going to go out in electronic format, it'll also go out um, in print. Next month. Next month. So uh, look for that. But you can get many of these, everything except for the, the Restoring the Ancient Church, you can get in the bookstore today. Take a look at those things. Those things, those productions help fund the work that we do and cover our expenses. Um, but again, the expenses really is a minor part of it. If we were to add up the time value of the volunteerism that goes on at FAIR, 
our, our, we would have to claim that you know, our cash flow would have to be much higher if we were to pay these people to do that. So I want to take a moment right now and I want to recognize not one, but I want to recognize two individuals who have made significant contributions to FAIR and to the defense of the church and the kingdom. So as I call your name, if you would come up. First, I would like to announce that Stephen Densley is a recipient of the Defender of the Faith Award for 2012. Steve Densley has stepped up with our podcast work. Here you go. He has stepped up with our podcast work. He has helped us um, with regards to um, our, our public relations efforts. Um, he put out great podcasts with Joshua, who spoke yesterday uh, on the issues of, of uh, same-sex attraction with the church. These are really great, hard-hitting, um, hard-hitting pieces. Our podcasts are actually tremendous. Um, tremendous resources and I encourage you to go to them but we really think everything that Stephen has done for us and he's just been a tremendous resource and we congratulate you for your achievements for us thank you the other person I uh, we want to recognize is an individual who actually joined us about a year ago um, this person uh, wrote us in and asked a question about some responses that we had given on, on an issue. And I wrote back and saw what she did with the answers. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to get her into FAIR. And so I invited her to join. And since she has joined, she has been instrumental in helping us to get, um, to get she's actually the one. If you, how many of you receive the, um, the FAIR's front page? Raise your hand. Okay, if you don't know about it, Fair's Front Page is news clippings about the church, good and bad. It's a tremendous amount of work to do that. She does this every day. She is one of the, uh, the, the, the key driving forces behind Mormon Voices. If you don't know what that is, go home and look it up. We could use your voices to join with ours. Um, but she's been a driving force with that. She's a great contributor to all of our Ask the Apologist responses. And so we want to recognize Cassandra Hedelius if she would come forward as one of the recipients of the 2012 Defender of the Faith Award. Big step, but she's, she's used to doing that. So congratulations, Cassandra, and thank you. So with that, I'll get out of your way. I'll stop standing between you and your food. But I do want to thank everybody who's come, who's contributed. And uh, most importantly, if there's ever anything that you can think of that we can do to improve ourselves, FAIR wants to do the right thing at all times. If you can think of any way that we can improve, you can write to me, Jay Lynch at FAIRLDS.org. You can write to President at FAIRLDS.org. We'll take it and we'll run with it. So thank you and thanks for your attendance today.